where do we begin, you two? I mean, this is very dishy. But I had to wonder, do you think the average person really gives a flying you-know-what about CBS, Viacom, and Sumner Redstone? Jim, I'll start with you. (laughs) Well, I don't think that matters because the story is about much more than particular companies or even these particular characters. To, to us, it, you know, I think we both saw this as it's a family drama. It's a story about a father and a daughter. It's about a woman being thrust into the male shark tank of Hollywood and surmounting one obstacle after another. And, you know, other people have compared to succession. I think it goes way beyond succession. It's entertaining, but I think it is like no, good novels are, I hope. It's very revealing about our times. It's almost Shakespearean in many ways with, I don't even know, all the Shakespearean plays that could be bundled up and thrown into this one. And I thought about it, it's like it's like succession, billions, and dynasty all <laughs> rolled into one. Rachel, have I forgotten any <laughs> drama? Well, I've been joking that this is King Lear meets Weekend at Bernie's. That's a concept, right? (laughs) (laughs) Tell me how this collaboration began, because I understand it was an anonymous tip that brought you two together and really kind of brought your your respective investigative reporting skills into one project. Rachel, how did this happen? I mean, it's remarkable. Jim and I, I don't think we'd ever have a conversation before we started working together. And I had been doing a lot of Me Too reporting for The Times. Jim, obviously, is an esteemed uh, a business journalist and columnist. And we, our paths had just not intersected. And um, I, an anonymous tip came through the New York Times tip line, and it was forwarded to me because it had to do with CBS. And I had been working on some investigations about CBS, and it's, it's CBS's investigation into its culture. And the person who emailed us, it was very clear immediately, was in a position to just have a treasure trove of information, text messages, emails, things that ultimately really led to us doing this book together. But what happened was, you know, this email comes in and an editor at the time says, you know, I think Jim Stewart is working on something very similar. He's also got a tip about something going on at, at CBS and, and you really should talk to him. And so, uh, you know, Jim is a very uh, a, a respected, towering figure in our industry. And I was almost a little bit nervous to talk to him, but he had the good fortune. We both had the good fortune that he sat on the outside aisle. So as I was walking home one day and I already had my coat on, I just thought, well, I'll just stop by his desk and ask. And and I stopped and I said, you know, here you're working on the CBS story. And I explained a little bit. And that's how this came together. We ended up writing stories for the Times. And it was very clear that there was way more to the story uh, that deserved a book, basically. And you had a lot of the goods. And Jim, I'm sure you were like, I need to bring this woman in and and work on this together. Well, Rachel's confidential source, I think it was Rachel's source because they really developed the relationship, is probably the single most productive source I've ever encountered in my decades of reporting. I mean, she handed over an immense amount of testimony, of documents, of texts and emails, as Rachel said. Then we had other confidential sources, too. Some of them I cultivated, some she did. We got many other great um, documenting materials, but it really enabled us to let the reader be a fly on the wall in these amazing scenes that, you know, that I, as a journalist, have never been able to do before. I'm in the CBS boardroom, the comments, and oh my God, the comments like blew my mind. Or in the Sumner Redstone mansion, which by the way, where everything was recorded and videotaped, um, you're a fly on the wall when Sumner Redstone like kicks out his live-in girlfriends. I mean, it's astonishingly um, direct material that we were able to weave into the story. Of course, I'm dying to know who the source was. And I know (laughs) if you told me, you'd have to kill me. But boy, lucky you to have access to all of this. Well, let's take a step back, though. And I want you all to talk about Sumner Redstone, who I had the pleasure of interviewing once uh, when I was at the Today Show. I don't know if you all watched that for your research. It wasn't particularly revealing, but who is this guy? Who wants to take that? Sumner may be the last of the old time moguls. And in some way you might want to hope he's the last of the, the old time moguls because he assembled a multi-billion dollar empire. And, you know, you have to 
admire this. He started with a few drive-in movie theaters outside of Boston, where he was born, and he snapped up other companies. He bought Viacom, which owned a lot of cable channels, MTV, Cartoon Network, uh, you know, very successful cable channels. He then went on to buy CBS, the broadcast network. He added Paramount Movie Studio, Studio. So he had a fully integrated media empire long before a lot of other people did. But interestingly, he really descended on Hollywood as a multi-billionaire mogul when he was age 76. Really, right. he was just getting started. I don't know how old he was. I don't remember how old he was when you interviewed him. But, you know, he was getting up there. Old. And, you know, a lot of the story takes place when he's in his 90s and still, you know, one of the most powerful and richest media moguls on the planet. Rachel, how did people treat Sumner Redstone initially? Because he really was a fish out of water, this guy from Boston. And boy, there are a lot of stories about him, which we'll get into in a moment. But was he considered an outsider? And how did people take to him initially? Well, he certainly appeared like an outsider. I mean, as we detail in the book, his appearance alone, you know, just a little bit sloppy, the hair, you know, that still looked like it came from a bottle. You know, this is not a guy right? kind of frumpy. frumpy. Yes, kind of frumpy. This was not a man who looked like a polished movie executive. Um, he he didn't carry himself the way that Les Moonves did, for example. Um, he this was he not didn't a have manicure. Les's veneers, for example. He did not have Les's veneers, but he had certainly he had. Uh, the same kind of ambition. Uh, uh, Sumner Redstone was ruthless. And, I, you know, I have to say this is really an example of he forced people to take him seriously because he had the money. He had the money and the drive and the power. So, you know, he was able to push a lot of stuff through just on on, on sheer dint of will alone. We have the guest list of his various birthday parties. And, you know, every A-list person is there. You know, you've got enough money and power in Hollywood. You know, at one point he threw Tom Cruise off the Paramount lot. And then he brought him back. And then Tom Cruise is there at his birthday party. I, I mean, Sumner could get anybody he wanted at any time. Tell me a little bit about his style personality. You talk about him being ruthless, but how did he operate out in the world, Jim? Well, he was intensely competitive and um, nothing he, he, he had to win, including, you know, a tennis game with his own daughter. He was furious when she she beat him. He had to win at every single thing that he did. I mean, I'll let other people ponder the psychology of that. At the same time, I think like a lot of these people, he was insecure. You know, his early life, his mother was a dominating figure. She wouldn't let him date. He studied all the time. And he sort of, you know, again, he re hit Hollywood at age 76. And he sort of, sort of relived what for most people would be an adolescence. He's like dating every good looking woman who crossed his path. And by the way, he could get people to come to his party. Well, he could get pretty much anybody he wanted to go on a date with him, given his money and power. Yuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's more to that. <laughs> Maybe Rachel wants to address Yeah, well, well, we'll talk about that, that in a moment, Rachel. But, you know, how did he, for, for people who are not necessarily well-versed on Viacom and all the ins and outs of that company, how did he go from owning a few movie theaters to being this uh, big maca out in Hollywood, Rachel? Uh, he basically went on a, uh, like I said, a ruthless acquisition. I mean, one of the, his big wins was MTV. And, and I remember this because MTV was this kind of uh, uh, a rebel, rebellious um, little company that ran music videos and put musicians on the air that no one had ever heard of. People would, executives would go to the office in tennis shoes and jeans. You know, this was not a corporate environment. And and this was something, you know, as Jim said, this is a, Sumner was a guy who had to win at any cost. And he had to have MTV over the objections of some of the executives there. And that is one of the, I would say, like one of the biggest, most recognizable brands that's in the Viacom empire. What did he do then? Then how did he amass? I mean, take me from the beginning, though. You know, this guy's in Boston. He owns these movie theaters. How did he get from Boston to Hollywood? Well, it, it's pretty simple. A, a two words, junk bonds. Uh, he borrowed money. He used leverage. He claims to have invented the multiplex. He, he took the drive-ins and he turned them into, you know, uh, those, you know, kind of suburban drive-in things where, you know, there were many movies showing at once kind of anachronism now maybe, but at the time that was an innovation. But once he had the theaters under his belt and went on his 
his buying spree, it was borrowed money. And it was a time when most people were afraid to do that. But he hooked up with Michael Milken. Uh, Michael Milken befriended many sort of outsiders who, you know, had the, you know, the brazenness to borrow the money and take the plunge. One of, one of Sunder's proudest moments was when he outbid and beat Barry Diller to get the Paramount studio. And for somebody who started with drive-in theaters to get Paramount, which you know, was one of the premier studios, the, the, you know, the, the Mount Everest of Hollywood from his perspective was an unbelievable achievement, which by the way, figures in the story because the last thing he wanted to do was ever give up Paramount. There, there's a reason now the whole company is called Paramount. And then, so how did, and explain what Viacom is exactly, this whole conglomeration of businesses. Can you do that, Rachel, for us? Sure. And Jim, Jim can also chime in here, but, but Viacom is at this point, it's a much more diminished company. I think that is sort of the most important thing. Well, let's talk about at the height of, of Viacom, what it was. Ultimately, where did he land and what did he have in his purview? He landed at the top of the mountain. At, at one point, Viacom was one of the most important media companies of its time. It had, as I mentioned, MTV, but it also had Nickelodeon, which it has really fallen from grace. But Nickelodeon was was printing money at one point at its height. Um, he also had CBS, of course. And, you know, this was a guy who looked at Rupert Murdoch and was jealous. You know, he wanted to be that big. And Jim, I'm sure you have something to add about just sort of Viacom at, at its peak. Well, I, you know, it was it had these ve very valuable cable channels. And until pretty recently, cable channels was just a printing press for money. You no, know, because of the cable bundle, consumers bought a whole bundle, whether they watched it or not. They were paying, you know, for MTV. They were paying for Comedy Central. They're paying for Nickelodeon. There has never, ever been a media model that was more profitable than what turned into the cable model. Now, streaming is completely blowing that up, which is why Vi Viacom came on, came under some si significant problems. But when, when, when Sumner Redstone divided his assets into the CBS business on one hand and the Viacom business on the other, Viacom, Viacom was the high growth company. It had the cable channels, it had the movie studio, and that was the one that he thought was going to get Wall Street all excited. And also, you know, just to, you know, we obviously can't get inside Les Moonves' mind entirely, although our text messages from him, you know, come really close. But when when Sumner Redstone split those two companies, CBS and Viacom, Moonves was furious that he got the sort of the also rants, which was CBS. It was last in the ratings. It was not doing well. And you have to imagine that because under him, it went to the most consistently watched broadcast network, which factors into our story because you'd have to imagine that if he took it from last ran to that, then when Sherry Redstone comes in and starts saying, oh, I want to merge the companies, I want to do this, I want to do that, you know, he's probably thinking, what? But I, you know, I fixed this place. Let's talk about the relationship with Sumner Redstone and his daughter, because as you mentioned earlier, this is really a human drama and a real succession story. Can you all talk about their dynamic? Earlier, Jim, you said that he wanted to beat her in tennis. And we'd have to probably understand the psychology of that or maybe never could. Talk to me about their dynamic and how it ebbed and flowed or changed through the years. Sure. Uh, yeah, basically, I mean, this is a guy who has withheld his love from his own child and who and, and his child, Cherry Redstone, yearned for it until the day he died. And I think a lot of people can relate to the idea of having sort of an imperial parent who is withholding at times, and who who who, who uh, gives out love sparingly and affection sparingly, and it can also be incredibly harsh. I mean, the kind of the kind of yearning for approval and affection that that push and pull and take away creates uh, really was at play here. And I think it's a play at a lot of families. And, you know, she, she, one of the reasons why she was sort of reluctant to be part of her father's empire was because she has maintained she wanted to be with her own children. And, you know, you'd have to wonder, was that in some way an attempt to think, well, I, you know, I don't want to play out this, repeat the same dynamics that, that I had to suffer through with my dad. I'd have to say, um, I'd call this a, an abusive relationship myself. I mean, Sumner, for example, would write uh, emails and he would send them to Sherry with horrible language in them. I'm not going to say in this interview, horrible. And then he would copy them to all, to, to uh, Viacom and CBS executives and board members. 
And so they read the same things that he was sending to Sherry, which, of course, made her cry. Um, he didn't show up when she got, you know, the Woman of the Year Award in New York. He he sent an open letter criticizing her that was printed in Forbes. She read that and she cried. You know, there's a lot written about, um, you know, fathers and sons and mothers and sons. I don't think the complicated relationships of fathers and daughters have been explored nearly as much. And here you see an aging patriarch who, on the one hand, is horribly sexist and critical of his children. By the way, he drove his son away completely and took up these surrogate sons. And then at the same time, he wants someone in the family to carry on the family name. It's They see that tension going back and forth throughout the story. Why do you think he was so ugly to Sherry? Rachel, I mean, where did that come from, this abusive, hateful, cruel behavior towards his own daughter? Well, I think a lot of it is what Jim said earlier, that this is a guy who had to win at every cost, and he could not, he was incapable of being happy for his own kid if it cost him something. I think that's sort of the key here. And this was also a man who was known for firing executives if the stock dropped, like, I don't know, half a cent or something. This this guy... I think sort of the ruthlessness in business, he also really played out with his his dynamic with his daughter. Why, you know, who's to say, but it's certainly, it's, it was certainly, it's certainly not um, a, a typical father-daughter relationship or father well, ta- or parent-daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think readers can, you know, from their own experience can kind of see what's going on there. But Sumner was the kind of person that no matter who it was, if somebody else succeeded in a way that somehow might diminish his accomplishments or stature, he hated and resented that. So when Sherry got praise from the outside, Sumner's immediate response was, well, wait a minute, I'm the one who built this company. I gave them everything that they've got. And, you know, there's a whiff in there that having made them, you know, incredibly wealthy, he had to build it all himself. He had these harsh parents. He had the demanding mother. And they, you know, they had it kind of handed to them on a silver platter created by by him. And so to the extent they sort of succeeded on their own, he lashed out. We're going to talk about sort of what happened with the business and with Sherry in a moment, but we have to talk about Sumner's insatiable sexual appetite, because this is something, honestly, it's like, what? Um, I know that, that it, your book makes clear that Sumner's libido uh, would not slow down as he got older. Let's talk about his attitude toward women in general, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of some of those conquests. I mean, his attitude in a word was awful. And, you know, for anybody wondering how, how companies like CBS or Weinstein company or really any companies could have had uh, uh, systemic problems, inherent cultural problems with women, with covering up misconduct. I mean, Look no further than the way some of these guys acted in their personal lives. Like to to think that that is divorced from their attitudes toward women in the workplace is is I think a, a really a big misconception. And he 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 basically he treated women like um like they were uh, interchangeable, like they were for sale. I mean, we, in our book, you can we detail a lot of the women coming in and out of the mansion, women getting paid. Um, uh, you know, he even tried to go after his son's girlfriend at one point. Which his we grandson's detail in the book. girlfriend, his grandson. Excuse me, his, his grandson. At one point, he tries to go after his grandson's girlfriend in the book. So, uh, which is a, a crazy story in and of itself that we write about. So, you know, to, to, to a guy like Sumner, nothing was off limits. And it's that sense of entitlement that I think gets a lot of these guys into trouble. Why didn't he ever get me to, Jim? Well, I think... Uh, his misconduct. He died. Was, his no, his misconduct <laughs> was usually accompanied by a lot of money. I mean, and I mean millions of dollars, a million here, ten million there, seven million to this woman, and you know, I I don't know. I I mean, it, there was certainly ample material there, and you know, Rachel and I talked a lot about this. It, it's interesting that as this mogul, and again, an, an elderly one, when he got to Hollywood. A lot of this seems to have been so important to him more to impress his cronies. You know, he was he was his best friend. I put that in quotes because who knows if these people ever actually had any real friends. But Robert Evans, who was, you know, the legendary 
producer who was a notorious womanizer, always bragging about his conquests. And this other group of sort of aging moguls, it was almost like he just wanted to be able to like appear with this beautiful blonde on his arm or a gorgeous woman. And and again, I think the reason nobody was blowing the whistle, even now, I mean, Rachel can testify to this because she did a lot of this work. You know, these women did not want to talk. It, it wasn't like, oh, we're eager to tell what happened with Sumner Redstone. Oh, no. There was a notorious story about him even before I interviewed him, when there was a fire at the Copley Plaza. And of course, this led to his disfigured hand. But I can't do it justice since you all dug deep into this. (laughs) Fire away, Rachel, so to speak. What was the scene there? Um, He was there with a mistress, girlfriend, mistress. He was there at the Copley Plaza Hotel with, uh, with somebody who was not his wife. And I can't remember, was she, did she die in that fire no, 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 or no, did no. she? They both escaped no. out the window. But, but a remarkable they, thing mm-hmm. about it is it was never, it was decades before that fact that he was actually in there and escape with a mistress was ever published. It was no, at the time there was, it was all about the heroic escape and rescue of Sumner Redstone, not a word in the press that there was a mistress in there with him. Isn't that what caused his, his hand to be? All uh, yes, he was hanging. And, oh and- yes, yes. He. I'm sorry. That so. Yes, he basically escaped out the window. And the legend of this is that he clung for dear life with his hand and was able to continue clinging even as the fire burned and disfigured his hand for the rest of his life. And he would tell this story as an example of how he could survive anything and like that had how strong his ambition was and his will to live. I mean, this is also a guy who would say only half jokingly that he never expected to die. So why did he need a succession plan? I remember uh, reading that he said that to Sherry, right? Or said that to one of his girlfriends, I guess. But he said that pretty much to anybody who would listen. Although again, <laughs> what I found so interesting and that our, you know, our reporting uncovered was that he confided in one of his girlfriends that the reason he said that was not so much that he actually thought he was going to live forever, but that he feared a final reckoning with his maker and that he was going to be judged very harshly. It does show a certain self-awareness that his behavior was in many cases beyond the pale. And I think what he might have been most afraid of was being judged for how he treated his own children. Two women figure quite largely in in this book, and and those were women who were in Sumner's later life. Sherry Redstone, not so fondly named them S&M, Sidney Holland, and Manuela Herzer. Who were they, and how did they come to to know Sumner? Well, Sumner was dating, you know, everyone across his path, including his grandson's girlfriends. And so his grandson actually set him up, of all people, with Patty Stanger, the millionaire matchmaker of reality TV fame. And she eventually... That's going to be him. a great scene in the series, you guys. <laughs> it's incredible. She'll play herself. So, yeah, she should. So she is the one who introduced him to, to Sidney Holland. They were friends. And Sidney Holland had, I guess you could call it a somewhat checkered past. Um, she had been dating older, wealthy men. And um, according to her, they had a whirlwind courtship. And in short order, she had a nine carat diamond ring on her finger and moved in to the mansion with Sumner. Sometime after that, one of Sumner's previous girlfriends, who who Robert Evans introduced to him, there should have been a warning flag right there. She was having her house remodeled, paid for by Sumner, and she decided to move into the mansion while the remodeling was going on. As far as I know, the remodeling is still going on because she stayed. So these two women were now living in the mansion. Sydney was supposedly his fiance and girlfriend, and Manuela, his ex-girlfriend, was now just a close confidant and companion. But they were living in there, and slowly but surely, they started getting their hands on the estate plan, the trust plan, the bank accounts, the shareholders. And again, to me, one of the startling revelations in the book, on one one day alone, they got him to sell all of his CBS stock, which he said he never would do, and he transferred, he made a wire transfer of $90 million to the two of them that afternoon. And in fact, when he died, didn't they 
share $150 million of his wealth? Yes. By, by the time all was said and done, they had managed to separate over $150 million from him. And that, by the way, may be an understatement. We, you know, we can't say to the penny how much there meant. It may have been many millions more than that. There was also Malia Andelin. She was a flight attendant on one of his private jets. How would you describe their relationship? Stockholm syndrome. I mean, this was this was a woman who was not making a ton of money. I mean, it would paid well to work on the corporate jet, but she she works on this thing and she encounters Redstone, who was known for just being horrific to the people that worked for him, especially people on his planes, by the way. And she flies with him one day and he's just alternating between being abusive to her, cursing at her and hitting on her in full in full view, by the way, of his guests. OK, who, do, who don't really do much of anything. Um, and uh, and and she, of course, is worried that about her job and subsequently um, uh, does not get invited back to any more flights on the corporate jet, which was an important source of income. And and when she's she's calling up and calling up and trying to get uh, 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 gigs to, to, to work more as a flight attendant. And at the same time, Sumner is pursuing her. He's asking her out to dinner. He's sending gifts. He's, he's really aggressive, you know, in the same way he is in business. He found something he wants to acquire because I think, you know, to him, he treated a lot of women like acquisitions and she's thinking like, well, maybe this is how I, I can get my job back. He, and he keeps dangling, you know, subsequently they do meet and we detail all of this in the book and go into more detail, but he's basically, over the course of their early interactions, he's basically dangling job prospects for her. You know, if you ha come have dinner with me and maybe we can talk about, you know, getting back on the plane. And so this, it's, you know, that's why I say Stockholm syndrome, because she didn't really have a lot of good choices. I mean, what else are you going to do? The billionaire is saying, maybe we'll give you work again. And and Sydney and, and Manuela plotted against her, right, Jim? Yeah, you know, Sidney and Manuela were not only tolerant, but sort of encouraged him to you know, like have, you know, I don't know how to put this nicely, but shall we say encounters with other women who then got money because that kind of took some of the pressure off them, I think. But this so was they, going to So they wouldn't far. have to sleep with them? Yes. I mean, there were so many women who were brought into that mansion and then, you know, they they were getting these you know, these sacks full of, you know, cash and they, you know, handed a thousand dollars here, ten thousand dollars there. Anyway. Anyway, that's all document. You can you can see that in the book. But while that was going on, the Malia thing got out of hand. Sumner's infatuation with Malia was was threatening to Sydney. I mean, this was going way beyond like just having a prostitute in now and then. Um, and he was singing to her. He was like sending her love poems, and he was taking her to events. I think this, by the way, was very significant. She was a very lovely person. She, you know, very attractive. And she would show up on these red carpet things on Sumner's arm. And that, you know, that made it, you know, that's exactly what he wanted, the image he wanted to project. But they got jealous about this. So they cooked up this whole, they hired a private detective um, and they followed her. She, at some point, she was concerned about her safety, even whether her life was threatened. And they convinced Sumner that she was cheating on him and had another boyfriend, which she did. And he got all upset about that and they managed to break them up. I have to add another show to this, and this is Sister Wives. I mean, <laughs> what the heck is going on? And if Sumner is such a shrewd businessman, how was he um, manipulated and bamboozled by these two women so easily? I mean, I joked about, you know, King Lear meets Weekend at Bernie's, but on a somber note, one thing that was really upsetting to to report on and just listen to and think about is all the elder abuse that is detailed in this book. And one of the shocking, if not surprising things that I think a lot of people can relate to is that the combination of getting older, uh, w wanting companionship, the vulnerability, uh, uh, declining health, all of these things make a person more vulnerable to outside influences. And I think I was really shocked that Sumner Redstone, for all of his wealth and power and resources, did not have more guardrails up around him to prevent people like this from getting in. And just going back to the millionaire matchmaker for a second, like for your uh, most of your audience uh, maybe has not does not understand who this person is. This is a woman who had a Bravo reality show where women would be corralled into a bar. And so just for the opportunity to meet one so-called millionaire. So this was not like a uh, like a like a 
sort a of classy you, matchmaking you, service. This was not the kind of this was not the kind of matchmaking service that you think the rich and powerful billionaires avail themselves of. You know, the kind of people that don't have even have a website. So the idea that Sumner Redstone would turn to her, that his family would encourage him to use a service like this. I mean, it just feels like there were no protections. Well, clearly in these situations, Jim, mostly it's your children who are going to protect you, right? And he's so alienated. I mean, who is the first line of defense when someone's getting older? It's someone's kids who are going to protect that person when their, you know, faculties start to falter. And he didn't have those relationships, right, Jim? No, not right, at Jim? all. And in fact, as you see, he made his health care proxy first his sort of surrogate son, the chief executive of, Vi- of Viacom, one of his companies. And then after that, he made Manuela Herzer the companion, the, the health care proxy, rather than his own daughter. And, you know, I think Rachel makes a good point. You know, as he got older, he declined. And we we gained access to previously confidential evaluations of his mental state. And this is true, I think, of so many people as they, you know, age. It's not a clear-cut case of mental competence or not. It's a gray area in between. It is sad to read this report when you know what he was like at his peak. But clearly, he was in decline. He was emotionally vulnerable. And these two women, whether it was instinct or whether they, you know, knew how to do this, preyed on his vulnerabilities. They they isolated him from the rest of the world. They isolated him from his family. They banned calls into the house. They changed phone numbers. They did everything to cut him off from anyone except them. And you can see how successful it was. Again, I think one of the shocking things in the book is how close Sidney and Manuela came to gaining control of the entire empire. Are they going to face any? repercussions for this behavior? I mean, what what happened to them? Well, we should point out that they've never been charged with a crime. You know, the, the, the authorities did investigate claims of elder abuse. They did not find any wrongdoing. Um, and, uh, it, you know, are they going to face any consequences? I mean, so far, they seem to swan around Los Angeles, you know, chairing up boards and running charities. And they're described by all these prestigious institutions and their biographies as, you know, accomplished uh, philanthropists. So, it, you know, so far, it seems like they they've made out really pretty well with a lot of money and, and, and some some measure of respect and, and acceptance. Yeah, I, I would add that that, that inve- so-called investigation and elder abuse was a joke. I mean, they sent Los Angeles, you know, protective services sent somebody out there and all they did was interview uh, Sumner himself with his lawyer and caregivers standing right there. They didn't interview any of the nurses or any of the people who filed the complaint, number one. But secondly, the Redstones did file suit an elder abuse suit against them. Uh, seeking the return of some of these many millions they got. But in the end, they Sherry Rest in particular, she didn't want to litigate this. She didn't care that much about the money. She just wanted them out of her life. So they ended up settling those cases, leaving their fortunes intact. And Rachel's right. They, they are, they're now styling themselves as philanthropists. They're on various boards. And when you read their biographies on the boards of, you know, relatively prestigious institutions, guess what? There is no mention of Sumner Redstone in those biographies, yet he is the source of the many millions that have no doubt enabled them to, you know, get into these these charitable activities, which, again, you know, the whole book really shows with enough money, what can you accomplish? A lot. That's what I was going to say. I mean, I can't believe people would have them on their boards, but I guess money talks, right? This book, more than anything, really emphasizes that money cannot buy you happiness. It can buy you a lot, but this is really a tale of that. And I also think, you know, as Jim was saying, anybody who's ever had to decide whether or not to take a driver's license away from a parent or had to figure out whether to step in because they were trying to figure out, is my parent able to to lead their own independent life? As Jim said, this book, you will people will relate to this because it's not all clear cut. Let's move from the personal to the professional. I mean, obviously, in many ways, Sumner Redstone's professional life was as juicy and drama-filled as his personal life, Um, especially the fall of Les Moonves, which I am particularly interested in since he hired me. It's astonishing to realize the extent to which the CBS board protected him despite the damning evidence uh, against him. How do you explain that? Well, um, Jim, you want to take that? They, the, the, the CBS board was 
except for the, those loyal to Sherry Redstone or picked by Sherry Redstone, who were a minority, were, were basically picked by Les Moonves. They were friends of his. They were cronies of his. They were very strong supporters of him. And for the most part, they were, you know, white men of his generation. Not all the, um, the lead independent director had led the um, NAACP, but they were in awe of Les. I mean, unlike a Harvey Weinstein, Les Moonves was running a major public corporation and was doing it incredibly well. He was named by the Hollywood Reporter as the most powerful man in the media and entertainment world. He, Wall Street loved him. So from strictly a shareholder perspective, you could see that they were, daz they were dazzled by him. But beyond that, they had attitudes about women. And so that, you know, frankly, are pretty anachronistic by today's standards. And so when these first the allegations came up, their immediate impulse was, oh, there can't be anything to that. Um, we'll, you know, they said, well, we'll ask Les. So they asked Les, he denies it. They said, okay, end of that. We have nothing more to investigate. You know, more allegations come up that you can't really refute. And they're, they, you know, now they're saying, oh, well, it all happened a long time ago. Or as one director, Arnold Cobleson actually said, oh, we all did that. Um, he, he sent an email that we saw that said, if a hundred more women came forward, we don't care. Les is our leader and we're standing by him. I remember reading that, I think probably in your early reporting on this, it, it right? Was just, yeah, it was just unbelievably blind loyalty. And at the same time, suspicion of, hostility of, and absolutely no confidence in, you know, Sherry Redstone. It's not coincidence that she's the daughter and she's a woman. And Les Moonves was a very successful white male. I guess one of the mysteries is why Les would have unleashed a corporate civil war knowing that his predatory behavior was, uh, you know, at great and imminent risk of being publicly revealed. Those are your words. Um, are you any closer, having written this book, to understanding Les's mindset? Well, he was in a terrible position, you know, as you as you can read in his text messages and his anguish communications with other board members. He it, this is not the decision to go to war with the Redstones was not one he made light lightly. And by the end of it, I mean, he he was he, he was damned if he did and damned if he didn't. If he, you know, launching this nuclear option potentially exposed him, but withdrawing and not doing anything was also a terrible option because, you know, he as I mentioned earlier, he didn't want this woman meddling in his business and in a business that he gave himself more credit than anyone for making a success. I think when you read the narrative, you will understand why he did that, even though on the face of it, it seems crazy. And that's because he'd already denied to the board that they had anything to worry about on this Me Too front. Then the reason, of course, he didn't want to go forward was that. So he couldn't admit to the board the real reason why he didn't want to do it. At the same time, if he if he pulled the plug on it, the board members saying, look, you're going to lose our back. You're going to lose face. He didn't want to lose face with the board. He says at one point, there's, there's no way out here. There's no good answer. It's terrible either, either way. And you see in the text, he's drinking. He's kind of incoherent. He's going through this anguish. He's suffering. There was no way out. And of course, he decided to go forward and I guess just roll the dice and hope desperately that he could somehow keep all this quiet. He was between the proverbial rock and a hard place, which seems completely apropos in this case, um, because he apparently had a CBS employee on call for oral sex. What? <laughs> come on. <laughs> and did that ever come out? Or is this new in your book? Uh, I, th th we, we reported in the Times, but there's certainly more color, if you will, around all of that in the book. And, um, you know, you'd like to think that this kind of thing post Me Too doesn't happen again. But 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 why? I mean, these companies are run it, by, in many cases, people who grew up in the same generation as Les Moonves and and his cronies on the board. And, you know, companies have gotten much better at managing their PR crises over the last few years. I think they've gotten a lot less better at actually changing, you know, internal cultures and, and until some until a scandal breaks, frankly. Yeah, the, re the reason we could report that, which frankly is one of the revelations that utterly floored me, 
that you would have someone on call for oral sex on the payroll. But that and some other revelations in the book emerged from, amazingly, Les Moonves himself. When he was late in the story, he was interrogated by lawyers for CBS. And they said, look, tell us what else was going on. Did anything else happen here? And, and he kept stressing, oh, it was all consensual. But he was the one, Les Moonves confessed to the existence of this woman on the payroll, as well as an affair he had, you know, ongoing with a married woman. And um, we, we do not reveal the names of these people. They've never come forward. They've never complained. Again, he was saying, oh, they didn't complain about this. You know, they're, they're, they were fine. You know, and so he didn't really think that there was anything wrong with this. And even though he was using, you know, CBS shareholder assets and money to create this situation. And as the lawyers themselves concluded, he was, he was utterly tone deaf to how this would look. Whether the women agreed or not, you can't do this in a public company. And then, of course, there's the infamous UCLA doctor story, right? When he went for a physical. Uh, I, I mean, that's beyond belief to me still. I can't believe the arrogance and stupidity of masturbating in front of a doctor. What? That and that was the kind that was the accusation that really put some people who were close to Moonves and had previously been willing to dismiss allegations over the edge. I mean, the idea that he would do this to a doctor in a professional setting, that was the thing that really turned tipped the scales for some people. That's interesting because I still think there's that sort of sexist, antiquated attitude about women sort of who, you know, colleagues maybe being, you know, wanting to be a part of this, right? But this was such a clear affront to really a relative stranger. I, it's just upsetting to me that I, I'm not really articulating it well, you guys, but it's upsetting to me that it took an outsider to seal his fate and that some of these other women were not believed or excuses were made for his behavior, right? Yeah, it's almost like in order to be taken seriously as a woman, she had to be a doctor. It wasn't enough for her to be an executive or a masseuse or, you know, whatever. She had to be, oh my God, a doctor. Like, we should really take this one seriously. I agree with you. I mean, there's so much rampant sexism in this book. Not the least of which, by the way, is the fact that Sherry Redstone was accused of leaking a bunch of these stories about his behavior. And as we de detail in the book, there is no evidence for that. And I personally do not think that a man would have been accused of being, as other people put it, conniving, manipulative, scheming, you know, the suspicion cast on her, the words used to describe what people thought she did were, I mean, we'll never know, but I mean, come on, those are tin, those words are tinged with sexism. Yeah, you make a good point, Katie, that the New Yorker magazine published two big articles revealing 12 women who came forward accusing Moonves of sexual misconduct. And that those were not really the reasons that he ultimately got pushed out. The board I think to this day, if that had been it, he might have survived. It was the, the doctor incident, which was not in The New Yorker. And it was the fact, as we disclose, you know, in the book in great detail, that there was an actress he was trying to keep quiet. And her manager was squeezing Moonves to try to get a role for her. And he was making a lot of progress with this. And when the board lawyers and the board found out about this, that too was a nail in his coffin because here he was succumbing to this pressure, talking to the CBS casting director, encouraging them to hire this, this woman to keep her quiet and without disclosing any of that. And so that too was what finally did him in. What is Les Moonves doing today? And do you think he'll ever make a comeback? Stranger things have happened. And I know some of his colleagues in Hollywood think with his enormous wealth, his popular and attractive wife, that and his powerful friends that somehow he'll in some way he'll reemerge. Do you think, Jim, that's actually possible? I, I wouldn't I would never count him out. I mean, he, as you point out, he has many friends in Hollywood. I have personal friends in Hollywood who I talk to who have said, you know, look, I don't, I don't really know what happened there, but he was extremely good to me early in my career. I wouldn't be where I am today if it's not for him. And I, you know, I'm never going to forget that. Um, there are a lot of people who would, you know, warmly welcome him back if they had some protective cover. And with the passage of time, who knows? 
Uh, I think when you read this book, um, that might set this campaign back a little bit, but, but you're right. You know, he was very well liked, unlike Harvey Weinstein. He's never been charged with a crime. He's never been civilly sued. Much of this did happen a long time ago. And Julie Chen, his wife, has staunchly defended him. And that has carried, I think, a lot of weight in the you know power circles of Hollywood. Do you think he's plotting his, his comeback, Rachel? I think Hollywood loves a redemption story. And I think that no business is as image conscious as Hollywood. And I would bet that a lot of the reason why we're not hearing more from him about what he's doing is because people don't want to be associated with him, not because they condemn his behavior. And I think that as soon as enough time has passed where people will think, well, you know, I can be in business with this guy without getting the stench on me, then we're going to it's going to be more likely that we could see some activity for him. him. So just because he's lying low and not doing a lot now, I, I don't think that that is necessarily a predictor of future behavior or interest. Having said that, he's no spring chicken. I mean, how old is Les now, Jim? Well, S- Sumner was in his 90s, right, when he was doing a lot of this behavior. So who knows? Uh, well, one of the... Um... One of the interesting aspects of, of all of this to me, and as Sherry Redstone said to him at one point, you know, you know, Les, you're going to be 70, you know, you've got an incredible reputation, you know, why not step down, you know, or why not consider, you know, passing the torch? And yet, no, he wouldn't do that. And uh, I, you know, I think, you know, there are these people at Hol- in Hollywood, this is their whole life, this is their, you know, entire identity wrapped up in there and they're just not willing to stop. So, you know, I mean, look, here's Sumner Redstone in his 90s saying, I'm not going away. I'm still the chairman of these companies and I'm going to live forever. So, you know, by comparison to Sumner, Les is a young guy. Well, so many of these people stay too long at the fair and um, I think live to rue the day that they wouldn't let go because ultimately they're forced out or they have an embarrassing downfall and they just refuse to quit while they're ahead because the power is just simply too intoxicating. Let's talk about Sherry Redstone as we wrap up our conversation. She got the last laugh, didn't she? I mean, tell me about Sherry today, how she's viewed and um, has respect for her grown now that her dad isn't trashing her every chance he gets. I mean, there is no way to deny that she emerged victorious. I mean, how could you not respect that, especially given the fact that uh, what she was up against? She had an unsupportive father for much of her career. She had a board that didn't respect her. She was up against, you know, she was warring with her chief executive. So I think anybody would look at this and think that this woman survived and succeeded against all odds. Yeah. And, you know, you have to give her credit. She was, I think, right about putting those companies together. They did need greater scale. They should have done it years earlier, but better late than never. And they've produced some big hits. You know, Top Gun Maverick was a huge blockbuster. Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Like yeah. the most. But I wouldn't really even today say that um, Sherry Redstone had the last laugh. I mean, she has gained tremendous respect in the industry. On the other hand, I think the last scene in the book is very poignant. You know, her father has died. She, you know, asked his very close confidant, do you think he really loved me? And I think that's so poignant that even after he's died and she has succeeded, she can't be sure of that. I mean, and deep down, isn't that what every child wants? And going back to what Rachel said to me, this is such a universal story about the relationship between a father and a daughter and a daughter or any child's need for the love and approval of their parent. That's a great way to end. But I do have to ask you, do you think the dysfunction that was depicted in this book is a thing of the past or are we still likely to witness this kind of behavior, scandal and drama in the future? Wherever there's power, wherever there's power and money, I guess there's there's scandal and 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 debauchery and treachery. Right. Yes. I mean, just because, you know, Harvey Weinstein and subsequent stories have broken does not mean that people change overnight. And the cynical side of me thinks that, you know, people with power and money are always going to be behaving badly. And uh, it's just a matter of whether they get caught. So, you know, I guess I guess that's my cynical answer. And that's good because that gives you guys plenty to write about, right? Well, Katie, can I I just point out that we are writing about it? I mean, just to name the media and entertainment industry, the dramas that are going on at Fox and News Corp, 
at Disney, at Warner Brothers Discovery. I rest my case. What would you say is Sumner Redstone's legacy? Rachel, you start. I think he built a media empire, and I think ultimately, ultimately his legacy is is one. It should be it should be a cautionary tale about how at the end of the day, business and successful business is human. And this is very much a human story about how family dysfunction affected a multi-billion dollar empire and that you basically have to get your house in order. Jim? It certainly shows how far sheer determination and will can take you. But it also shows that once you succeed, that success and the money that comes with it can blind you to what's really important in life. Well, Jim and Rachel, thank you both so much for for talking to me about the book. I know it's going to be a huge success because people eat this stuff up. (laughs) And I'm looking forward to uh, the scripted series that I'm sure will follow this best-selling book. It's great to see both of you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Katie.